Hi everyone, it's Katrina. The Epic of Gilgamesh While working at the British Museum in 1872, expert in ancient Assyria George Smith rediscovered a lost ancient Mesopotamian saga written on some cuneiform tablets from the ruins of Nineveh in what is now modern-day Iraq. These tablets were known as the Epic of Gilgamesh. Smith was looking for evidence of biblical events when he came across the tale written in the ancient language made up of triangular symbols. It bears striking similarities to the story of Noah's Ark in the book of Genesis, and it describes a devastating flood, a ship stuck on a mountain, and a character quite like the Bible's Noah. Like Noah, a man named Utnapishtim loaded his family and all species of animals onto a boat to survive a global flood caused by the evils of humankind. Utnapishtim received orders to build the boat in a dream and released birds as a test to find land before ultimately landing his ark on a mountain. This is one of several ancient flood stories from different cultures, including Sumerian, Babylonian, and Assyrian versions that are all similar to each other and to the story of Noah's Ark. The oldest known fragments of these tales date back to 2000 BC, and experts believe that the story originated much earlier, back to when humans were just starting out. The Epic of Gilgamesh speaks of several gods, while Noah's Ark is centered around Yahweh, the god of ancient Israel. In this story, Utnapishtim's flood lasted six days and nights, while Noah endured the catastrophe much longer at least 40 days and nights. Despite these differences, experts generally agree that there is a relationship between these ancient stories. They just don't know what it is. Some scholars believe that the ancient Hebrews who wrote Noah's Ark had also gotten this story passed down and may have been borrowed or descended from the Babylonians. Others think that the flood stories all have a single source that predates the Sumerians. It's unknown whether these stories describe events that actually happened but it's clear that these stories describe events so similarly that there must be some kind of connection. Crystal Skulls Legend holds that between 15,000 and 10,000 years ago, an ancient Mesoamerican civilization created 13 crystal skulls that had supernatural powers. They are rumored to be scattered throughout different collections today. The skulls vary in size and shade. Some are clear while others are smoky-hued or brightly colored. They also range in size with some skulls being human-sized and others smaller and less detailed. Many believe that the skulls have healing properties and enhance the psychic abilities of the people around them, and some even think that they were made with the help of ancient aliens or by residents of the lost city of Atlantis. Pseudoscience author Joshua Shapiro believes that these skulls are ancient computers that detect and record nearby energy and vibrations. He co-authored a book on the topic in which he claims that these skulls contain a history of the world and that they pictorially replay all of the images of people and things they have come into contact with. Most mainstream experts reject Shapiro's fantastical claims. In an effort to put the debate to rest, scientists from the British Museum analyzed some of these skulls using electron microscopes. They found markings that were made with modern tools and determined that these skulls were probably made in Germany sometime during the mid to late 19th century. So it's unlikely that any of the far-flung stories about the skulls are true, and they are probably far more ordinary than many people would like to think. Rama's Bridge Also known as Rama Setu or Adam's Bridge, Rama's Bridge is a chain of limestone shoals situated between India's southeastern coast and Sri Lanka's northwestern coast. Today, the two landmasses are separated by about 18 miles of water but they may have been connected by the bridge in the past, when sea levels were much lower than they are now. Some alternative historians argue that Rama's bridge is man-made and that its ruins became submerged at some point, but there is no solid evidence of this being the case. Plus, experts insist that organized societies did not arise until around 5,000 years ago, and Rama's bridge is much older than that. They point toward its age as evidence that it's not man-made but a natural formation. However, a conflicting school of thought sees the bridge as evidence that civilizations arose much earlier than we originally thought. According to the Hindu epic, the Ramayana, the structure was built by the god Rama. The Ramayana also speaks of giants and monsters roaming the earth, gods flying through the air on ships, and other things that seem more fantastical than fact-based, so most historians regard it as a fictional story.
People who believe that Rama's bridge has supernatural or man-made origins have no plans to stop pleading their case. The matter has even gone to court in India, where the country's archaeological survey argued that it found no evidence that Rama's bridge is anything other than a natural formation. Cleopatra's Tomb Cleopatra and her lover Mark Antony committed suicide in 30 BC, marking the end of Egypt's Ptolemaic dynasty. They were buried together in a magnificent tomb filled with treasures made from gold, silver, emeralds, pearls, and ivory. According to the first-century writer Plutarch, their shared tomb is located near a temple dedicated to the Egyptian goddess Isis. Its exact location remains a mystery to this day. Archaeologists have excavated numerous sites in an attempt to find the burial, but to no avail. One woman named Kathleen Martinez has dedicated her career to searching for Cleopatra's final resting place. Her team spent 14 years digging near Alexandria at a site called Taposiris Magna, but they have yet to find any evidence that the famous ruler was buried there. Cleopatra was determined not to let the conquering Roman Empire find her in Antony's tomb, according to Martinez. She escaped Roman custody after being taken as a prisoner and ended her life in a place where she knew her people would find her body before her captors could. Most researchers believe that the chances of finding Cleopatra's tomb are slim. Speaking with Live Science last year, experts said that they were less than confident that her burial will ever be uncovered. They pointed out that the tomb could be in a part of Alexandria that is now underwater or that it's been looted or plundered beyond recognition. I wanted to give a big shout out to Veronica and JD and Marjorie Johnston. So glad you found us. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already because we have lots more mysteries and discoveries coming up. Plain of Jars The Xiang Kuang Plateau of modern-day Laos is scattered with thousands of ancient jars arranged in clusters, numbering anywhere from one to several hundred. Their age, their purpose, and the reason for the arrangements are a mystery. The jars were originally dated to sometime between 1240 and 660 BC, but scientists can't seem to agree on how old they are. Some experts believe that the jars were used for prehistoric burials, while local legend holds that the jars stored food, alcohol, rainwater, and other things. It's difficult to study the vessels because they sit among millions of unexploded bombs left over from the Vietnam War. In fact, less than 10% of the jars have been thoroughly investigated. This is slowly changing as researchers work to identify sites that are safe to visit. Recent research using advanced technology traced some of the jars to the second millennium BC. Human bones and skeletons found at some sites were around the same age, while others were from much later, between the 9th and 13th centuries. This indicates that the jars were reused over a vast time span. Scholars are still trying to determine whether the jars maintained a certain ritual significance throughout this period or if they had different meanings and uses. Another mystery experts are trying to solve is how ancient people moved the jars, which weigh as much as 33 tons each and were sourced from a quarry five miles away. The Lone Cave Woman Sometime during the fourth millennium BC, a young woman died in a cave in northern Italy. Over 5,000 years later, in 2015, archaeologists found her skull inside a vertical shaft in the cave. They had to use special climbing equipment to reach it, and no other human remains were found nearby. Experts spent several decades trying to figure out how this skull ended up in such a difficult place to access. They concluded that natural forces like mudslides, sinkholes, and floods must have moved it throughout the cave system over time. The woman was somewhere between 24 and 35 years old when she died during Italy's Copper Age. She suffered from an endocrine disorder and malnutrition, and she may have had tumors. Her tooth enamel was underdeveloped, showing that her health problems started during childhood. At the time, the regional population was increasing as hunter-gatherers shifted to farming and started settling permanently in one place. This change exposed people to more pathogens and parasites, making them more vulnerable to illness, and they began eating a diet that was much higher in carbohydrates. These factors helped to explain the woman's poor teeth and other ailments, but her identity and other details of her life will remain a mystery. Schist Disc During the 1930s, British Egyptologist Walter Emery unearthed a strange-looking disc near Djoser's Pyramid at Saqqara. He found the artifact known as the Schist Disc, or the Egyptian Trilobed Disc, inside the tomb of Prince Sabu, which dates back to sometime between 3100 and 3000 BC. 
The object measures roughly two feet in diameter, and nobody knows what it is. Some speculate that it's a wheel, which makes sense because it certainly looks like one. But as far as experts know, the wheel didn't appear in Egypt until around 1500 BC. This means that if the schist disk is a wheel, it could rewrite history in some pretty major ways. Others believe that the 5,000-year-old artifact is part of an advanced ancient device that has not been discovered yet. Meanwhile, some think that it was decoration, or that it had ritual or religious significance. In addition to not knowing what the disk is, archaeologists are unsure how it was made. Schist is a delicate material that is difficult and time-consuming for even today's best craftsmen to work with. Both the disk and the skills required to produce it seem to indicate that the ancient Egyptians were more technologically advanced than we give them credit for. But as long as the questions revolving around the artifact remain unanswered, nobody can say for sure that this is the case. The Heretical Monk Giordano Bruno was a 16th century Italian monk and philosopher from Naples, Italy. He landed himself in some hot water when he suggested that suns are stars that the planets revolve around and that the universe has no center, putting him way ahead of even the time period's most modern thinkers. These views challenged the widely held belief at the time that our solar system was the center of the universe and went against big-name thinkers like Copernicus and Kepler. Bruno fled Naples in 1576 to avoid the Roman Inquisition, which sought to stop the spread of Protestantism by persecuting people who disagreed with the Catholic Church. He spent several years in France, where he gained the favor of some influential people and eventually moved to London, where he lived at the French ambassador's home. Bruno had some powerful supporters, but he had just as many powerful enemies and a constant target on his back. He returned to France and wore out his welcome there before moving to Germany. From there, he was invited to live in Venice. But when he arrived, the Inquisition arrested him and threw him in jail, where he languished for the next eight years. Bruno was repeatedly questioned throughout his imprisonment and refused to recant his beliefs, which might have saved his life. He was burned at the stake in 1600 after being found guilty of heresy. Experts only know vague details about his final days and execution. Records of the event are missing, so the specific reasons for putting Bruno to death are unknown. Historians are unsure whether his cosmological beliefs were the main reason he was put to death, or if he committed other religious offenses. The Nine Unknown Men According to legend, a group of men came together around 226 BC and formed a secret society that possessed vast collections of advanced knowledge that was inaccessible to the average person. Known as the Nine Unknown Men, the organization allegedly used what it knew to gain political power and manipulate society for its own benefit. The group was originally started by Emperor Ashoka. He was the grandson of Chandragupta, the emperor who unified the Indian subcontinent. After engaging in a brutal war against a neighboring region, Ashoka swore off violence and vowed to only use intellect for good. His goal involved collecting and documenting as much knowledge as possible. But one man could never do all this on his own especially an emperor who had other duties to attend to. Ashoka commissioned nine of India's best thinkers to help him carry out his vision. For security reasons, their identities were kept a secret. They gathered all the information they possibly could about science, technology, and other important topics. Each member was tasked with updating a certain book. When his service ended, he passed his book on to a new member. Some believe that the nine unknown men still exist, if this is true, it would make the organization over 2,000 years old. Yet no one knows who they are, and the content of their books remains a mystery. In 1923, English writer Talbot Mundy published a book called The Nine Unknown Men, which lists the book's titles as Propaganda, Physiology, Microbiology, Alchemy, Communication, Gravity, Cosmogony, Light, and Sociology. Since the group was such a secret, there is no way to know if the nine unknown men ever existed in the first place. Some argue that even if the group was real, chances are it's no longer around today. The USS Indianapolis The USS Indianapolis was discovered thanks to the billionaire Paul Allen, sitting at the very bottom of the Philippine Sea. Paul Allen was the co-founder of Microsoft, as well as the son of a veteran from World War II. He put a lot of his money into tracking down lost war machines and sunken battleships. After decades of searching, he finally located the USS Indianapolis in August of 2017. It was sitting at a depth of over 18,000 feet. 
According to Paul Allen himself at the time of the discovery, he was hoping that by taking photos of the lost battlecruiser after nearly 80 years, survivors and family members would finally get some closure. The USS Indianapolis sank during World War II on July 30, 1945. It was struck by torpedoes that came whistling out of a Japanese submarine. Just 12 minutes after the first torpedo hit the Indianapolis, it was completely underwater. The sinking of the vessel turned into one of the worst naval disasters in American history. At the time, there were at least 1,200 sailors on board. Around 300 of them died when the ship was hit, and 890 survivors were stuck on makeshift rafts. They were stranded at sea, surrounded by sharks, and no one was coming to save them. When the ship went down, everyone aboard tried to swim together to gather in a group, scared to death. Over several days, sharks began to gather, smelling the blood and fear in the water. They would go after those who had been separated from the larger groups. It is unknown how many died from shark attacks, since many were also injured and suffered severely from dehydration. They were finally saved after four days and five nights in the water, when they were spotted by a U.S. Navy plane on patrol. Of the 900 or so men who made it into the water, only 316 survived. There was no distress call, so the Navy never sent a search party. No one knew the location of where the ship sank, so finding it was like finding a needle in a haystack. In the quest for the lost ship, historians were able to find records showing the ship's location 11 hours before it sank. Thanks to this information, an ROV, and a very determined group of people, the expedition found the Indianapolis. 93-year-old Indianapolis survivor Arthur Lienerman said, I am very happy that they found it. It's been a long 72 years coming. Unexploded Bombs On the Solomon Islands, over 100 unexploded bombs from World War II have been found, and not scattered around at different places. They were all found in the backyard of somebody's house. Approximately 100 unexploded pieces of ordnance, meaning bombs that never blew up when they were supposed to, were uncovered by a guy digging a hole for a new septic system at his house. He had no idea he was literally living on a field of bombs. If he had struck his shovel hard enough to set off one of the explosives, it could have caused a chain reaction that blew his house into a million pieces, or himself. According to the police on the Solomon Islands, the bombs were secured and then diffused without any risks. Perhaps a bigger issue is the fact that this happened at all. Unfortunately, thousands of bombs were dropped all across the Pacific Islands during the war. This includes places like the Solomon Islands, Palau, and Papua New Guinea. Many of these bombs didn't explode. They simply hit the ground and then were eventually covered up by grass. After all these years, more and more people are starting construction projects in these remote places. And this means that, sadly for them, they run the risk of accidentally setting off an unexploded bomb in their own backyard. Ancient Cake On March 28, 1942, the British carried out their first major air attack on a German city. The British Royal Air Force sent bombers to the German city of Lubbock. In the destruction that followed, three churches were reduced to ruins, 400 tons of bombs were dropped, 25,000 people lost their homes and were forced to live in the street, and the historic center of the city was annihilated. But through all the chaos, one thing did survive. It was a cake. The cake was discovered recently in an old cellar in the modern city of Lubbock. It doesn't look very tasty anymore, seeing as it's 79 years old. But it's still recognizable as a solidified preserved hazelnut cake. It has its original decorative toppings, including a swirl of icing. Depending on just how hungry you are, you might even consider eating it. When the cake was discovered, it was still wrapped in its original wax paper. The baker must have just finished making it, wrapped it up, and then put it in the cellar to keep it fresh. But then the bombs fell, the baker's house was destroyed, and the cake was lost for almost a century. According to Lisa Wren, the excavation manager on the project, the heat from the blast that destroyed the baker's house reduced the cake to only a third of its original size. Lost Cars a mysterious trove of cars from the World War II era were discovered in a quarry in rural France. Apparently, the cars were hidden inside the quarry to avoid them being taken by the German army. And believe it or not, it wasn't a crew of archaeologists who discovered these amazing vehicles. It was a physical education teacher from Belgium. In his spare time, Vincent Michel explores abandoned urban places. He and a few friends stumbled upon the quarry completely by accident 
and ended up being the first people to lay eyes on the vehicles in nearly 80 years. Of course, none of them were in very good condition. Most had already rusted away to be nothing but ugly carriages, but still, it was like walking through a portal into the 1930s. Even the owner of the quarry hadn't known the vehicles were there. After all, it had been sealed around the time of the war after the cars were stashed inside. With all the chaos that came in the years of fighting, they were just kind of forgotten. Since the urban explorer made the discovery, the owner of the quarry has extracted the few vehicles still in salvageable condition to be sold at auction. As for the rest, they are too fragile to move and will remain rotting in the quarry for the foreseeable future, maybe for other explorers to come and see. The Ghostly Ocean Floor At the bottom of the Pacific Ocean, more than 1,000 miles from the nearest country, there is a ghostly graveyard of sunken aircrafts and vessels from World War II. There are so many artifacts down there, it is a treasure trove of objects from the 40s. This area of the Pacific Ocean is known as Truk Lagoon, over 1,000 miles from Micronesia. It was here where Operation Hailstone went down in February of 1944. Today, there are over 40 Japanese ships and 250 aircraft resting at the bottom of the sea. The Japanese had been using the area as a floating base, but when the Allied forces decided to strike, there was nothing they could do. The Americans descended upon Truk Lagoon with the fury of hell, destroying cruisers, merchant ships, auxiliaries, and severely crippling the Japanese presence in the Pacific Ocean. By the time the fighting was over, after 48 hours, the Japanese Navy was in rough shape. They were forced to give up the lagoon, abandoning their wrecked vessels to the bottom of the ocean. 80 years later, Truk Lagoon is one of the biggest underwater graveyards for military vehicles in the world. The underwater graveyard serves as a very eerie memorial for the attack on the Japanese and is now a popular diving destination. So I want to give a big shout out to Sophia Venn and Samuel J. Thanks so much for watching and supporting Origins Explained. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe for more videos like these. Hero Pigeon An unusual hero from World War II was discovered stuffed inside of a chimney. The bizarre discovery was made in Surrey, England, and the hero wasn't what you might expect. It wasn't a person, but rather a pigeon. It was a spy pigeon, one that survived a difficult journey from Nazi-occupied territory hundreds of miles from home. After completing its mission, the pigeon flew back to England, sat down on the edge of a chimney to rest, and sadly died. It was probably because of the fumes coming from the fire below, or maybe it was exhaustion. Whatever the case, it tumbled into the chimney and was lost for about 70 years. The current owner of the home, a man named David Martin, found the brave pigeon when he decided to renovate the fireplace. The pigeon was in pretty rough shape. Not much remained of it except for some small bones. But it still had the tiny capsule strapped to its leg bone with a coded message inside. David and his wife Anne unscrewed the capsule and uncovered a note written on cigarette paper. But they couldn't read it because it was written in code. It had likely been meant for the codebreakers at Bletchley Park, the intelligence center where workers struggled to beat the Nazi Enigma machine. During the war, pigeons were often used to deliver coded messages across the English Channel, but the only people who could solve them were the skilled codebreakers. In total, the Royal Air Force trained about 250,000 birds as part of the National Pigeon Service. Right now, experts are trying to decode this mysterious message, if for nothing else but a bit of fun. Did you have any idea that pigeons were used so extensively during World War II? Let me know in the comments below. Secret Nazi Nuclear Bunker A secret nuclear bunker was discovered by a filmmaker in Austria. The previously unknown complex was found outside the town of St. Gorgen and der Gusen, but they didn't simply stumble upon it by accident. They had to find it by deciphering intelligence reports and monitoring radiation in the area. The closer they got to the compound, the higher the radioactivity. The filmmaker is named Andreas Sulzer, and he came across reports of the abandoned bunker while going through old CIA papers from 1944. It was an American spy who brought the facility to the attention of his superiors, who eventually buried the information when it no longer became useful. According to the report, the facility was constructed using slave labor from the nearby concentration camp at Mauthausen Gusen. In total, the site covers 75 acres, but it's also connected to the underground factory where the very first jet-powered fighter plane was constructed, the Messerschmitt ME-262. After the war, the facility was glanced at by the Allies, but they didn't think it was that important and they just left it alone. 
The filmmaker had to use huge machines to rip apart the soil and break open the concrete to get to the underground bunker. While we don't know exactly what it was used for, it's believed that at least 320,000 slave workers died building it. The experts also say it had been used for nuclear development projects that never saw completion. Sadly, the local government actually made the filmmaker stop digging because he didn't technically have permission. Right now, everyone is still waiting for the next official excavation to begin. Hong Kong Bomb A bomb from World War II was found in a pretty unlikely spot, right in the middle of Hong Kong. It was actually found at a construction site in one of the busiest commercial areas of the city. 4,000 people or more were forced to evacuate while bomb experts were called in to disarm the explosive. It weighed a total of 992 pounds, identified by the professionals as an AN-M65. This was a type of explosive made by the United States in World War II and then dropped on Hong Kong when it was occupied by the Japanese. According to the BBC, it's actually not that uncommon for unexploded bombs to be found in the territory of Hong Kong. It was occupied by Japanese forces between 1941 and 1945, and just so happened to be an area of intense fighting between Britain and Japan. This time, the bomb was destroyed without incident, but if another one ever goes off by accident, it could take out a whole city block. The Lost Battlefield of Papua New Guinea An Australian adventurer discovered a lost battlefield from World War II deep in the jungles of Papua New Guinea. The Australian had hiked through the historical trail of Kokoda over a dozen times. The trail winds through a great mountain range for about 60 miles. It's part of a pilgrimage that Australians go on to honor the men who died here fighting against the Japanese as they tried to advance to the Australian shores. Since the adventurer, Brian Freeman, had spent so much time in the jungle here, he had earned himself a bit of a reputation with the local tribe. He was able to hang out with them and spend nights in their village. They then revealed to him that there was a secret battle site no more than a few hours from their secluded settlement. Brian managed to convince the villagers to take him deep into the jungle, where he found the remains of a World War II battle fought in 1942. This is the battlefield of Eora Creek, lost for over 70 years. Since it has been hidden in the jungle this whole time, Brian Freeman found it still perfectly intact. It's been heralded as one of the greatest World War II discoveries in recent years. There are still bombs throughout the battlefield, guns still set up to defend the trenches, along with plenty of World War II memorabilia. Grenades, weapons, shell casings, you name it. On October 22, 1942, fighting went down here for four days and four nights. As far as we can gather, about 79 Australians were killed and 69 Japanese soldiers lost their lives. But when the fighting stopped and the war moved on, the battlefield was lost. Swamp Ghost the Swamp Ghost is one of the most famous World War II relics still around today. The plane, a Boeing B-17E Flying Fortress, went down on February 23, 1942. It was damaged by enemy fire, lost fuel, and plunged down into the earth. This was while the plane was flying above Papua New Guinea, the place I just told you about with the secret battlefield. Captain Frederick C. Eaton Jr. had to ditch his plane in the swamp while he and his crew trekked out of the jungle. It was a brutal walk for the crew, taking days and almost killing them. The plane was quickly forgotten about. It wasn't rediscovered until 1972, when pilots began seeing it sticking out of the swamp as they flew over Papua New Guinea. In 1989, the Travis Air Force Base Heritage Center began stitching together plans to recover it, but it wouldn't be until 2006 that the legendary Swamp Ghost was finally taken out of the swamp where it had been for half a century. Then it would be another four years that the plane sat in limbo at a port in Papua New Guinea, waiting for permission to be imported back to the United States. Finally, in 2010, the Swamp Ghost was shipped to California, where it is getting renovated. Alien Figurines In Mexico, archaeologists have discovered plenty of interesting artifacts dating back to around the year 300. These pre-Columbian artifacts come in the form of statues, which look eerily similar to other statues found across the world in Asia. In Mexico, the statues depict human-like beings with odd, almost circular tube structures on their heads. While at first glance the tube things may look like hats, nobody really knows what they are. But the crazy part is that the statues from both Mexico and China have the same tube-like hat structures on their heads. Now, what could this suspicious coincidence mean? The first thought is that the two cultures got the idea for their sculptures from the same source. 
But how could this be possible when the figurines from China's Sanxingdui ruins date back 3,000 years? That's over 1,000 years earlier than the statues found in the Veracruz state of Mexico. And seeing that the people from ancient Mexico and ancient China never met face to face, the only reasonable explanation for the coincidence is aliens. Is it? I don't know. As outrageous as it sounds, the statues from both nations do appear to depict weird, not quite human, humanoids. They also share many of the same attributes. Many would love to believe that they were inspired by aliens and maybe they visited both civilizations in the distant past, then were immortalized in each society's artwork. The more likely explanation is that these shapes must have a deeper spiritual or practical purpose represented in a similar way by both societies. Hitler and Napoleon Adolf Hitler and Napoleon Bonaparte have some of the most surprising things in common. Yes, both were technically warmongering rulers of a European nation desperate to control the world, but their similarities go beyond that. Internet sleuths have pointed out it all comes down to the number 129. Napoleon was born in the year 1760, and Hitler was born in the year 1889. That's a difference of approximately 129 years. When Napoleon came into power, it was 1804. When Hitler came into power, it was 1933. Yet again, a difference of approximately 129 years. And the similarities just keep coming. Napoleon invaded Vienna in 1812. Hitler did it in 1941. Yet again, 129 years. When Napoleon was finally defeated for good, it was 1816. When Hitler lost the war for Germany, it was 1945. The difference is, you guessed it, 129 years. Of course, this doesn't prove anything tangible, it could just be an outrageous coincidence. Then again, it could be something spiritualists call synchronicity, when certain events sync up with one another for reasons beyond our own understanding. Napoleon and Hitler each came to power at the age of 44. Both attacked Russia six years later when they were 52. Both failed to take over Russia, and when they both lost the war, they were both 56 years old. Stonehenge's Cousin Across the water from Britain, there is a structure 4,000 years old that seems to be directly related to Stonehenge. It's a ringed sanctuary that was discovered in a small German village, something the experts are referring to as the cousin of Stonehenge. According to Archaeology magazine, the ancient structure can be found near Pomelta, sitting in the middle of a potato field. It's been undergoing excavations for the past 15 years. Archaeologists believe this structure was built either by the same people's descendants who built Stonehenge or by European visitors who witnessed the monument and went back home to build their own. After all, there are only about 300 years separating the two megaliths. The same rituals were likely going on at both sites, though researchers still have no idea what those rituals entailed. The purpose of both Stonehenge and its cousin in Germany remains a mystery. Keep in mind that both these structures were built at the beginning of the Bronze Age, a transitional period for humans in which we learned how to work metal, develop complex social structures, and to build wheels. But for some bizarre reason that scientists can't put a finger on, early humans were obsessed with building giant circles out of standing stones. And while most scientists agree it probably had something to do with the observable movements of the sun, there is no real way to know the truth. Cosmic Coincidence if you've ever looked up at the night sky and thought to yourself, that can't be real, there's no way, you're not alone. Space is a strange place, and so too is our very own moon. In fact, the moon has so many strange coincidences, it almost seems as if it was placed in its exact spot on purpose by someone who was extraordinarily good at math. The real coincidence has to do with the size of the moon, the sun, and the position of all three celestial objects. You've probably seen an eclipse at least once in your life, and you may have wondered how the small little moon was able to blot out the sun. After all, isn't the moon significantly smaller than the sun? The answer is yes. The moon is 400 times smaller than the sun. Coincidentally, the moon is 400 times closer to Earth than the sun is. These are exact numbers we're talking about, making it seem somewhat impossible that things ended up the way they are. The only reason that eclipses work is because of the number 400. If the moon was only 399 times closer to Earth, a full eclipse would never be possible. Alien skulls around the world During the 5th century AD, people all throughout Central Europe were practicing skull deformation. 
They would elongate their skulls by binding them with some kind of wrapping or even just a pair of hard wooden boards. The result of these skull modifications initially led archaeologists to believe they had stumbled upon alien skeletons when they were first discovered. For example, there is a graveyard in Hungary excavated in 1961, in which scientists found a massive collection of elongated skulls. What appeared to be alien relics were actually the remnants of a community of people who deformed their heads for unknown reasons. Now let's go to Mexico, where a very similar cemetery was excavated in 1999. This cemetery was found by residents of a small Mexican village called Onavas. They discovered it completely by accident during the construction of an irrigation canal. 25 human burials were uncovered, with 13 of them having those elongated and deformed skulls. At the time, they seemed to be the skeletons of aliens. Even worse, these ones had mutilated teeth, the result of filing the teeth into unique shapes. But these are hardly the only deformed skulls that have ever been found. According to what scientist Karina Nipper told Life Science, skull modification can be traced all the way back to the Paleolithic era, also known as the Stone Age. It spread across the world in the 2nd century BC. It moved from Central Asia all the way into Europe, becoming relatively popular during the last days of the Roman Empire. But why? That's the real question. Why was it so popular for so long? And how did people living in Central America and South America come up with the idea to do the same thing? The inspiration behind these body modifications is a mystery, but it's likely that the practice simply stemmed from what was deemed attractive at the time, much like the practices of foot binding, piercing, and tattooing. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Mysterious Dwarf Houses For around 2,000 years through the Northwest Caucasus in Russia, thousands of ancient dolmens were built. These ancient stone buildings were called Ispun by the locals, which translates roughly to House of Dwarves. The Caucasus spans much of the land between the Black Sea and Mount Elbrus. And when I say dolmen, I mean an ancient megalithic structure made from stone blocks. A dolmen usually had a single chamber, one large stone as a ceiling, and a small access point. No matter where the dolmens were made, they were almost always the same. And this brings us to the coincidence. Throughout the wastelands of Russia, scientists have found no less than 3,000 dolmens. They were used explicitly for human burials. But scientists have also found dolmens in other parts of Europe, in Korea, and throughout mainland Asia. The coincidence is that all these ancient cultures started building nearly identical stone dolmens, or dwarf houses, at the exact same time. And for the exact same reason. But we just don't know what it is. The Suspicious License Plate World War I began with the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, the Archduke of Austria. While riding in his car with his wife, he was shot and killed in the city of Sarajevo on June 28, 1914. His assassination triggered a series of events that would plunge the world into war and chaos. The car that Franz Ferdinand was riding in had a license plate. The number on the plate was A111118. Pulling these digits apart can represent them as 111118 or November 11, 1918. Coincidentally, this was the exact same date that the armistice was signed to end the war. In other words, the numbers on the license plate of the vehicle in which the Archduke was riding in, the man whose assassination started the war, were the same numbers as the day that the war ended. It's a bizarre coincidence that doesn't mean much, but it is still pretty spooky. Amazingly, nobody even noticed the coincidence until 2004, when Mike Dash, a writer for the Smithsonian Institute, was at the museum in Vienna where the infamous car is still on display, he noticed the numbers on the plate. He put the numbers into context, noticing a strange coincidence that people who had been working at the museum for decades had missed. What do you think about this? Let me know in the comments below. Twin Typhoons The great Mongol army of Kublai Khan should, in theory, have decimated Japan in the 13th century. The Mongolian Empire had taken down every single army that they went up against at the time. They had already conquered most of China and the surrounding regions, and were setting up to be the greatest power ever seen on Earth. So why didn't Kublai Khan ever take control of Japan? His invasion of the island nation failed because of a pair of bizarre coincidences that are honestly hard to believe. If Kublai Khan had taken Japan, history as we know it could look much different today. However, 
The truth of the matter is that when the Mongolian fleet tried to land in Japan in 1274, they were battered away by what the Japanese called divine kamikaze winds. The fleet was forced to turn back because of an uncontrollable typhoon. When they tried the invasion again seven years later in 1281, the same thing happened. A typhoon pushed the army back once again. In the seven years between, there hadn't been a single typhoon. It was as if some divine presence was pushing the Mongolian army away. After their second failed attempt, they simply gave up on Japan and went on to do other things. Pi and the Pyramid John Taylor was the first one to suggest that the builders of the Great Pyramid of Khufu, the biggest pyramid in Giza, had incorporated the number of pi into its design. He said that if you divided the perimeter of the pyramid by its height, you could obtain a reasonable approximation of pi. Not the exact thing, but pretty close. This made him theorize that the ancient builders had intended the pyramid to be a representation of Earth. The perimeter was supposed to correspond to the circumference of the equator. His ideas were published in a book about the pyramid back in 1859. After that, more and more scientists got on board with the theory of pi. We now know that if you divide the perimeter of the Great Pyramid by its height, you get an approximation of pi within 0.04% accuracy. The same can be said when adding up the slope of each face of the pyramid. The level of accuracy here seems absolutely ridiculous, if of course the theories are correct. It would mean that the Egyptians had mastered the art of math, and why not? If they really had used this pyramid as an approximate representation of the planet, it would mean they had somehow measured the entire globe, and this does not seem like something they could have done. But maybe they had more knowledge of the stars and of math than we give them credit for. But the remaining question is this. Did the Egyptians really try to incorporate the mathematics of pi into the pyramid, or is it all just a surprising coincidence? Eve and Pandora There is a very strange coincidence surrounding the Bible and a story from Greek mythology. It involves the very first woman ever created. In the Bible, the first woman was named Eve. This is spoken of in Genesis. After God created Adam from the dust of the ground, he created Eve using Adam's rib. At the time, there was no death or suffering, there wasn't a speck of evil in the world, and everything was smooth sailing. But in the end, Eve ate the forbidden fruit against the orders of God, and because of her sin, death and suffering swept into the world and evil made its first appearance. In Greek mythology, the first woman on the planet was Pandora. She was made from the water and earth, kind of like Adam, and then given a box that contained all the evil in the world. At the time of her creation, the world was a paradise. There was no death or suffering, and there was no evil. The evil was trapped in Pandora's box, which she was told never to open. But just like Eve, Pandora became curious and opened the box. Because of her curiosity, after breaking the rules, she unleashed evil on a global scale. Chronologically speaking, the story of Pandora came first. It's impossible to say whether the Bible copied the story, but you have to admit there are quite a few similarities. In both cases, the first woman is blamed for the origin of evil in a world that was formerly a perfect paradise. Coincidence? What do you think? Civil War Field Hospital the National Park Service has uncovered the grisly remains of a pair of soldiers dating back to the Civil War. They made the terrifying discovery inside a battlefield pit, once used by a surgeon to dump removed limbs after field surgery. According to the NPS, this is the first time that a surgeon's pit from a Civil War battlefield has been properly excavated. It's also the first time ever that actual bodies have been found in a pit that was supposed to have been used for amputated limbs. The excavated soldiers will be buried at the Arlington National Cemetery following examination, but there's not much that can be done for the 11 partial limbs that were found buried along with the bodies. So far, archaeologists have been able to determine that the soldiers were probably killed during the Second Battle of Manassas, though no one has been able to properly identify them yet. Both were males, both between 25 and 34 years old. One died from a bullet through the upper thigh, while the other was found filled with buckshot. Both soldiers had likely been seen as beyond saving by the field surgeon, which is why they were dumped in the limb pit and forgotten. Ancient Murder Mystery Archaeologists in China have discovered the body of a young man who had been stabbed to death and then left inside of a tunnel 1,300 years ago. Chinese archaeologists are calling this a very ancient murder mystery. They first came upon the mystery while excavating a tomb at the Xianzi Cemetery in the Ningxia region. 
There, the young man's body lay riddled with stab wounds. The team was able to estimate his age at around 25, and they believe that he was still alive when dumped into the tomb shaft and left to die. The murder itself took place around the year 640 AD. But even with all the archaeological evidence, what happened that led to this unfortunate man being stabbed at least 13 times in a violent assault remains a mystery. They even found that his arm was severely cut, suggesting he had been trying to cover his face during the attack. The tomb he was found in is from the East Han Dynasty, between 25 and 220 AD. The vertical shaft in which the body was discovered was part of a robber's tunnel. Grave robbers had been going down to raid the tomb. The best guess archaeologists have is that the murder victim came across their crime and tried to stop them. Then, to cover up what they were doing, the grave robbers killed the bystander and hid him inside the tomb. After they finished pillaging it, the thieves covered the entrance to the tunnel and left the bleeding man to suffer and die. Mass Sacrifices 600 years ago in the northern coast of Peru, there was a terrifying massacre. Scientists now believe that at least 140 children, three adults, and 200 young llamas had their hearts removed during a massive ritual sacrifice in the 1500s. The sheer amount of bones was quite the shock. Gabriel Prieto, expert in archaeology at the National University of Trujillo, began excavating in 2011. He and his colleagues were stunned to discover so many skeletons of children especially, most of them between the ages of 6 and 14. Judging by the way the bodies were buried, all their deaths were part of a single choreographed event on one traumatic day. Their mummified bones were uncovered lying on their side, rather than the more commonly seated position, and none of them had any offerings buried with them. Some of the older children's faces had been stained with red face paint and were buried wearing ceremonial headdresses. Then each child was surrounded by either one or two young llamas. All the children, boys and girls included, were killed the exact same way. A single slice across the sternum caused them to bleed out and die. As if that weren't bad enough, researchers found evidence that their rib cages were open so that their hearts could be removed immediately after death. It's possible that this even happened while the heart was still beating. The question remains, what happened here? The sacrificial event took place around 1450, when the Chimu ruled the region. The empire flourished from the 11th to the 15th century, but something really bad must have happened towards the end for them to think that their gods were angry with them. Prieto and his team said that there were heavy rains and flooding in the area that could have caused catastrophic damage to the food supply. To stop the rain, they sacrificed their most precious possessions. Bodies from World War I Over 100 years after World War I, a tunnel was discovered in France filled with the bodies of 270 German soldiers. These soldiers had been buried alive in the Winterberg Tunnel, near the small town of Craon in the north. They were part of the 111th Reserve Infantry Regiment participating in the Second Battle of the Aisne. They suffered a miserable death when a French artillery shell detonated on the tunnel. All entrances were closed, and the men inside were trapped. They were stuck inside the collapsed tunnel for six days before they were all dead. As the oxygen began to run out, the German soldiers either braved the airless vault and suffocated, killed themselves, or begged their comrades to kill them. Either way, all 270 of the soldiers died in the tunnel. Naturally, French authorities were not that eager to open the tunnel back up, and eventually people just kind of forgot about it. It was finally opened by a pair of amateur historians, a father and son team. Alan and Pierre Malinowski used a mechanical digger at a mysterious site where the pair had found the remains of machine guns, gas mask canisters, and other artifacts from World War I. Instinct told them that this was the legendary tunnel that had been sealed for over 100 years. So they dug through the earth until they finally broke open the tomb. What they found inside was terrifying. The men who had been trapped ever since May 4, 1917 were still in there. The air smelled strongly of death. The pair sealed the tunnel back up and contacted the authorities, who now have been tasked with getting the remains out and back to their home country of Germany. And now for a city beneath a city. But before that, it's shout out time. Big thank you to Among Stories and Ty Regwin for supporting this channel. You guys are the best. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos like these. The New Orleans Underground 
Today, New Orleans might seem like any ordinary above-ground city, albeit a little rambunctious. But beneath the surface is a secret trove of archaeological treasures. A lot of it has to do with Storyville, the infamous red-light district that operated in New Orleans from between 1897 and 1917. After prostitution was declared illegal, Storyville was forced to shut down. It was at around this time that plumbing was being introduced to Louisiana. People started using indoor plumbing, and so their old, outdated privies in their backyards became dump sites for garbage. Over 100 years later, archaeologists have been finding terrible things underneath Storyville, buried in these ancient toilet dumps. One of the discoveries was a collection of preserved goat jawbones. They were taken from an outhouse pit beneath the French Quarter on St. Peter Street. According to archaeologist Ryan Gray, the goat jawbones were probably left behind by a tailor. Tailors often used goat brains to process and tan their hides. To get to the brain, the tailor had to get the whole goat head. This resulted in plenty of bones being tossed into the backyard dump. Ghost Village The village of Old Perithia is located on the island of Corfu in Greece. It was abandoned in the 1960s, and then it became a ghost village. Hidden in the mountains, just far enough away from the coastal beach towns, this ghost village has recently been brought back to life. Old Perithia was founded sometime in the 14th century, during the reign of the Byzantine Empire. Today, it's the most ancient village anywhere in Corfu. It was built high up in the mountains, surrounded by forests to be safe from any potential pirate attacks. Back in those days, pirates frequently pillaged coastal towns, and there wasn't much the people living there could do about it. Old Perithia was built where the pirates couldn't easily reach. Living in the secluded wilderness also helped the people of Old Perithia to avoid diseases that spread along the coast, and they were also safer from mosquitoes. The beginning of the 20th century was when Old Perithia turned into a spooky ghost town. Being secluded was fine before the modern age, but now people were moving to the coast in droves. Eventually, there were only about four people left in the entire village, earning it the title of abandoned. The good news is that now, Old Perithia is coming back. While it was inconvenient for pirates, it's in a great location for the modern day, and slowly more people are trying to renovate this one spooky ancient place. Killed Crusaders Archaeologists have uncovered the mass grave of a group of slayed crusaders in modern Lebanon. In total, 25 men and teenage boys were uncovered at the bottom of a dry moat surrounding the ruined St. Louis Castle in Sidon. Radiocarbon dating shows that they were almost certainly Europeans from between the 11th and 13th centuries. They were Europeans convinced by priests and kings to pick up swords and reconquer the Holy Land. Sadly, most crusaders were amateur fighters and didn't have much experience. Traveling those great distances back in the day would have already been a challenge, let alone wearing armor and trying to fight in a far-off place. St. Louis' castle was taken by Europeans during the First Crusade in 1110. The Crusaders then held on to the strategic point for over a century, until two devastating attacks in a row. The Mamluks attacked in 1253, then the Mongols in 1260. According to Richard Mikulski, one of the archaeologists working on the project, the men had probably died during one of these attacks. Richard went on to say that the soldiers were found with wounds primarily on their backs, which means they were probably running away at the time they were killed, and their bodies were dumped into the castle moat and forgotten. Spider Mutants Researchers at the University of Wisconsin have used the scientific technique of RNA interference to create the very first spider mutants in the world. This horrifying discovery resulted in scientists creating the first genetically engineered daddy longleg spiders. They first sequenced the entire genome of the daddy longlegs, then used RNA interference to shut off certain genes. They created daddy longleg spiders with unusually short legs. According to Gilharm Gainet, the lead author on the study, they altered two Hox genes, which resulted in a gross malformation of the spider. Instead of being born with the normal long legs that give the spider its name, it had shorter legs, completely changing what the spider is supposed to be. While this might not seem that terrifying, unless you're the spider, it's opened the door to possibilities that are truly scary. Now that scientists know how to genetically create spider mutants, who knows what animals they'll experiment on next, and what they might do. This is how all these superhero origin stories start, right? Asian Mummies Archaeologists have finally solved a bizarre mystery involving mummies that goes back 4,000 years. 
About 100 years ago, a small group of mummies were uncovered in China's Taklamakan Desert. At this point, mummies hadn't really been found in China before. For this reason, scientists believed the people must have come from the West, sometime during the Bronze Age. When they moved to China, they brought with them their Mediterranean practices of making mummies. But keep in mind that the discovery was made over a century ago. They didn't really have the technology to properly identify the mummies or look at their DNA. But now, Chinese researchers have finally traced the ancestry of the creepy mummies back to a group of hunters from the Stone Age. These hunters had nothing to do with Europe. In fact, they had been living in Asia for at least 9,000 years. According to the researchers, the mummies belonged to members of the Xiaohe culture. Alison Betts from the University of Sydney says researchers know almost nothing about these people, other than that they were nomadic and apparently were mummifying their dead. Number 1. Siberian Graves In Siberia, archaeologists have uncovered an ancient grave that dates back 2,500 years. This grave holds the remains of four humans from the long-extinct Tagar culture. Two of the individuals appear to have been warriors, a male and a female. The third body belonged to a woman, while the fourth body belonged to an infant. Along with the remains, archaeologists found all kinds of amazing weaponry. They uncovered bronze daggers, war axes, and even battle knives. Plus, they found ancient items better suited to a prehistoric beauty parlor. They found bronze mirrors, fashion equipment, and even fancy combs made from animal horn. It's not clear exactly who these mysterious people were. The Russian Academy of Sciences says they were almost certainly a subculture of the Scythian civilization. They were buried with their weapons and beauty items just in case they needed them in the afterlife. As for how this strange group died, archaeologists say it could have been from illness. The warriors were in their 30s or 40s, the third woman was older, somewhere in her 60s, and the infant was only a few days old. The family may have been stricken by some sort of disease that took them all out overnight. If it wasn't a disease, scientists have no idea what could have led to the deaths of all four individuals simultaneously. The body showed no evidence of violence, and the family of four just seems to have dropped dead at the exact same time. Thanks for watching! Which of these scary discoveries did you like the most? Let me know in the comments below, and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. See you next time! Bye!